Section thirty five point fourteen, activated complex theory. This is the potential energy surface of a chemical system that involves a reaction from A plus B to the product P. So at first A and B react with each other and form a activated complex with higher energy. So this is a complex denoted by this double dagger. At the highest energy point, it's also called the transition state. This is the state of the activated complex at the highest energy point, and then A B complex becomes the product. When we are calculating the reaction rate constant, three equations can be used. First, the Arrhenius equation, right here, and then modified Arrhenius equation. This is usually more accurate than the Arrhenius equation. The difference is over here we have a pre-exponential constant in the Arrhenius equation. In the modified Arrhenius equation, the constant becomes the lowercase a times temperature to the power of m. m can be a real number, a non-zero real number. And this modified Arrhenius equation is often more accurate than the Arrhenius equation uh, with a theoretical uh, explanation. This is because there is a Accurate Irene equation that can be used to calculate the rate constant. So the formula is this: the rate constant is K B, the Boltzmann constant, times temperature T over the Planck constant, times this exponential function, e to the power of negative delta G double dagger over R T. This delta G double dagger is the Gibbs energy of the transition state. Minus the Gibbs energy of the reactants, and again this is the accurate equation for the rate constant. And now you can see this temperature here, and that's why the modified Arrhenius equation with a, a pre-exponential term that depends on temperature is a more accurate equation than the Arrhenius equation. Now let's look at this Irene equation. Again, this is the most accurate equation to calculate the reaction rate. We can separate this delta G double dagger into delta H double dagger minus T temperature times delta S double dagger. Now you can separate this exponential function into two exponential functions. Again. You have this delta H here, and you have T delta S here, and then we can combine these two. Why? Because if you look at this exponential function, temperature on top, temperature on the bottom, they cancel. So now we have a new equation. This equation is exactly the same as this equation. But why do we need to separate this? This is because delta G depends on temperature significantly. However, delta S Or delta H do not depend on temperature significantly. So this is easier for us to look at the temperature dependence of the rate constant. Now let's compare this Irene equation or this equation. They are exactly the same. So why don't we just compare this equation with the Arrhenius equation? Now we copy the Arrhenius equation here. This is very simple, and then this is the accurate, more accurate Irene equation. And then you can see we have a pre-exponential factor here, times e to the power of negative e sub a over R T. So right here you have e to the power of negative constant over R T, and over here you have e to the power of negative. This delta H is roughly a constant as well over R T. So intuitively, we'll say this e sub a is equal to this delta h, and then this pre-exponential function a is equal to this whole part. 
KBT over H times e to the power of delta s double dagger over r. The reason we put this exponential function of entropy into this pre-exponential factor is because right here we have e to the power of negative constant over rt. And this is e to the power of negative constant over rt. That's why we want to compare apple with apple. So this is the orange part. And this A is the orange part. We are comparing this orange with this orange. And then we draw a conclusion. Uh, if both E sub A and delta H are temperature independent, we'll say this activation energy is roughly the same as the enthalpy of activation. And this pre-exponential factor in the Arrhenius equation is approximately this expression, KBT over H times e to the power of delta s double dagger over r. So again, you can tell this pre-exponential factor in the Arrhenius equation contains the entropic effect. This is the entropic effect. There's another way to relate the Arrhenius equation and the accurate Arrhenius equation. Uh, the second way is to compare the dependence uh, of uh, the temperature dependence of L and K. So first, this is the Arrhenius equation. K is equal to a to the power of uh, a times e to the power of negative uh, e sub a over rt. We take the logarithm of both sides. We get L and K is equal to L and a minus e sub a over rt. Right again. This is the same as the Arrhenius equation. We just took the logarithm of both sides. And then if we plot L and K versus 1 over T, we'll be able to get a linear relationship. And the slope is negative E sub A over R. This is the slope. And the intercept is L and A. So if, again, we draw such a graph, we get the slope. The slope multiplied by negative r is the activation energy. Now let's analyze this um, Irene equation. So when we uh, analyze this Irene equation, we can also take the logarithm of both sides. We get ln k is equal to ln kb over h plus ln t minus delta g double dagger over rt. And somehow we cannot directly uh, plot this L and K versus 1 over T because of two reasons. One, the intercept is not a constant. It does depend on temperature. Two, over here, negative delta G double dagger over R is not a constant. It's not going to be a constant slope. So we need to do something smarter. So why don't we just analyze how this L and K depend on temperature. We do the first derivative of L and K with respect to temperature. This is the temperature dependence. And when we do this, make sure you understand this part. You learn this part in thermodynamics. The first derivative of delta G double dagger over T is negative delta H double dagger over T squared. So in this case, we can obtain the temperature dependence of L and K. It's here. Now let's get back to the Arrhenius equation. So in this equation, we can see L and K does depend on temperature, and also we can do this uh, d L and K over dt. Uh, this is how L and K depend on the temperature. The result is the activation energy over RT squared. So if you compare this dependence and this dependence, you'll realize the activation energy is slightly different from the enthalpy of activation. This is enthalpy of activation. This is activation energy. So this red part is equal to this red part. Uh, in this derivation, so from here to here, I assumed delta H and delta S are independent of temperature so that I can replace this delta G with delta H minus T times delta S, right? And then T times delta S over T 
is delta S. Delta S is independent of temperature and that part disappears. And then we only have delta H over T. Okay, we just take the first derivative of delta H over T with respect to T. And that's negative delta H over T squared. All right, so why can we assume delta H and delta S are in independent of temperature? Well, this is because when temperature changes from T1 to T2, indeed, delta H changes, but that, ch that change is small. So over here, this integral is the change of delta H. We need the CPM of the transition state. We need the CPM of the reactant. So the difference gives us delta CPM, all right? So this delta H at T2 is equal to delta H at T1 plus this correction, the integral of delta CPM. And this part is usually very small because the CPM of the transition state usually is very close to the CPM of the reactants. And then we can say, well, delta H at T2 is roughly the same as delta H at T1. For the same reason, delta S at T2 at T2 is roughly the same as delta S at T1. So that's why we assume delta H and delta S are independent of temperature. All right, and this is the uh, detailed derivation, you know, how can we get from here to here? And then we have these two equations that shows how L and K depend on temperature. This is from the Arrhenius equation. This is from the IRE equation. And we put an equal sign between this guy and this guy. All right, and we got this one. And now you can see E sub A, the activation energy, is greater than the enthalpy of activation. By how much? By RT. And delta H is smaller than the activation energy by RT. And usually RT is pretty small. If you are thinking about room temperature, RT is roughly 2.5 kilojoule per mole. But the activation energy and enthalpy of reaction for typical chemical reactions, usually it's uh, tens of kilojoule per mole, let's say 50 or 80 or even 100. If you compare 2.5 with 50, 80 or 100, usually this RT is very small. So if you say this activation energy is roughly equal to the enthalpy of activation, uh, you are also correct, approximately. Now, since we know this more accurate equation, delta H and E sub A differ by RT, we can convert this delta H to activation energy minus RT. When you do that, you can see over here, you have a one additional term. Negative, negative RT over RT is just one. So you have one additional term, which is e to the power one. This is e to the power one right here. And now if we compare the Irene equation with the Arrhenius equation, we'll see this part corresponds to this A, the pre-exponential coefficient in the Arrhenius equation. So this is a little bit more accurate comparison between the Irene equation and the uh, Arrhenius equation. And actually, uh, by looking at this uh, Irene equation, this part is Irene equation, uh, if we look at this, we can convert this delta H to delta U uh, because H is U plus PV by definition. So delta H is simply delta U plus delta PV. So we have delta U here, we have delta PV here. And we can make another approximation the volume of liquids and solids is much smaller than the volume of the gases. So we can focus on the gases only over here. And then if that's the case, we can uh, use the ideal gas law to convert PV to nRT. But this N is the number of moles of gases. And now look, we have this negative delta N gases. This is the change of the number of moles of gases from the reactants to the transition state. If we're doing a unimolecular reaction, so we have one mole reactant and one mole transition state, and then this delta N is simply zero. 
if we have a bimolecular reaction, let's say you have two reactants, but then when they form a activated complex, the number of moles of the gas is just one. And now we have delta N gas is one minus two. So this one is the uh, number of uh, activated complex. Two is the number of the reactants. And then we have this delta N gases to be negative one. Uh, if a reaction involves no gases, and then we can say delta H is roughly the same as delta U. Because again, delta N gases is roughly zero, therefore delta PV is negligible. Again, delta PV of liquids and solids is negligible. Now, uh, one more question here for you to think about. If I give you the reaction rate constants at different temperatures, how would you find the values for this enthalpy of activation, entropy of activation, and the Gibbs energy of activation? We'll get back to the Irene equation. This is the Irene equation. And we can take the logarithm of both sides. We get this equation, right? And again, if you just plot L and K versus 1 over T, that's going to be problematic because if you look at the intercept, it depends on temperature, right? So that's not right. If you're trying to do linear regression, the intercept is supposed to be independent of temperature. The slope is supposed to be independent of the temperature. So here's one trick. We can kind of move this L and T to the left-hand side. We got this equation. In this equation, you can see this ln, the logarithm of k over t, is equal to a constant minus delta g over r over t. So now if you plot ln k over t versus 1 over t, at least this part is constant. Okay, this part is dependent on temperature, but this part is independent of temperature. But there's another problem. If you plot this and do a linear regression, you will see this plot is not linear at all because this delta G is dependent of temperature. You're not going to get a constant slope. So we have to separate this delta G into delta H and T delta S. All right? So Replace this delta G with delta H minus T delta S. And then you may assume this delta H is a constant, delta S is constant. So this is uh, why I did this here. This is delta G. This part is delta G. Delta G is delta H minus T delta S. All right? And then if you look at this temperature here and this temperature here, you realize this two temperature cancel. You are looking at delta S over R. All right, delta S over R is independent of temperature. So that's why we need to combine this delta S over R with the logarithm of KB over H. And this part is your intercept, okay? So this sum is the intercept, not just this part. The sum of the logarithm of KB over H and delta S over R is the intercept. Now we have the slope. Negative delta H over R is the slope because delta H is independent of temperature. So now you can plot this logarithm of K over T versus 1 over T. You will get this slope. This sum is the slope. And this part is, oh, I'm sorry, this part is the intercept. And this part is the slope. Now if you have the slope multiplied by negative R, you will obtain the enthalpy of activation. So you have to plot this L and K over T versus 1 over T. And you need to realize that the slope is not negative delta G over R. The slope is negative delta H over R. Big difference. Again, G is H minus T S. Delta G is delta H minus T delta S at the reaction temperature T. So that's very important.